Awesome. Well, welcome back, everyone, to the Security Token Show interview series. We are joined today again with Ed Nowakity from Red Swan. Ed, how are you doing today? Jason, I'm doing very well. It's been a good day so far, and I'm sure this is going to be uh, a continuation of that. Uh, fantastic. I'm excited for a great conversation today. We're talking about real estate tokenization and how tokenization really provides an alternative for financing, specifically for real estate, as Ed has a, an extensive background in this. But for anyone that hasn't seen a previous interview with Ed or any of our previous content, Ed, can you give us a general idea of, you know, who is Red Swan? Who are you and why are we here today? Well, Red Swan is a portal where a marketplace for commercial real estate has been tokenized. Um, that means we take real estate equity or debt and fractionalize it into digital shares, security shares, and place it on the blockchain, allowing uh, investors from around the world to be able to have access to shares of these projects, either um, their land projects for redevelopment or existing projects in the recapitalization, but it allows the masses of investors around the world to participate. Uh, and also when they buy, it allows them to have the uh, liquidity options so that they can sell uh, like they do a stock certificate on the New York Stock Exchange. Fantastic. So there you have it. Fantastic platform, specifically in real estate and leveraging blockchain technology for the right reasons, uh, especially nowadays that we're seeing tokenization really take off at an institutional level uh, in terms of adoption and use cases. So for today's topic, Ed, I think it's maybe you know helpful if we start at a high level. You know, what do you see the real estate? You know, how have you seen real estate evolve over time and where is it at today in terms of the market? Well, that's a good question, Jason. You know, I've been in commercial real estate for over 20 years. I worked with Colliers in my first beginning of my career for, th for two and a half years. Then I went to Cushman Wakefield, where I ran uh, the market, the capital markets division for multifamily uh, for about 17 and a half years. So had a lot of experience in the market. And I'll tell you, since the time I got into the market to the time I got out, interest rates continued to decline and decline and decline. And that was you know, very good for real estate because when interest rates decline, that means money is cheaper, which means cap rates, pricing is higher, right? So people get early access to cheap money. They're able to uh, put a lower cap rate on the property, which means if they're paying a higher price for a property they're trying to acquire, which made my job a lot easier because uh, without having to really guess at it, the price will keep going up and up and up. And so I think over the past, you know, 20 years, you're looking at people who bought properties 20 years ago to where they are today, that property is probably worth four to 600% more than it was back then. So that's just kind of based on cap rates and interest rates. But because we're seeing the reverse effect right now of interest rates going up, which means cap rates are also going up, you're starting to see these same properties decline in value. Uh, and that's been a challenge for most sponsors and investors. Interesting. That's interesting. So, so you're saying like the more the interest rates rise, the more expensive it, it is to to you know borrow money for some of these developments and whatnot. Um, how does that impact on the property values? I, I guess it goes down, right? The property value lowers. What what does that implication have for any of the parties involved? I think it's a multi-party, you know, ecosystem, obviously. So can you explain to us maybe who's involved in some of these like traditional lend, you know, lending and borrowing situations and how do these cap rates affect each of them? So on the, on the typical real estate project, let's say it's a multifamily property, when you look at the capital stack, that's all the money in the project, right? So you have uh the sponsor who has his own his or her own equity, which may be 10 or 15% of the equity cash into the project. Then you have sponsor who has um, LP investors, which are you know, capital he raises from investors. Uh, and they usually bring close to 25 to 35% uh, equity to the cap table as well. And then you have lenders who are bringing their loan, uh, which makes up the different, the balance of the cap table. So roughly 40, 35 to 40% equity from the sponsor and its investors. And then uh, the 60 to 65% to equity coming from the banks or the lenders. So how it impacts all is that, well, with the cap rates going up, value is coming down. Uh, lenders have a problem because they have a certain covenants on a loan, which is kind of the, the LTV or LTC, loan to value or loan to cost. They want to stay within a certain threshold. So banks want to stay below a 80% uh, threshold of the value of the property to the value of the loan they're giving to the property. That gives them a cushion on the equity in case something goes wrong. Mm -hmm. Well, in today's market, 
uh, if the property value has dropped 20 to 25 percent because cap rates have increased significantly, the bank now has a hundred to 110 percent uh, loan the value on that property. So they're scared of that property because there's no reserves left, right? So therefore, they hopefully they have other reserves to, to help mitigate this property if it happens to come back to them. Uh, so that's one area of concern is the bank uh, lender does not want the values to drop. And when they do, um, they're in trouble. They need to either sell the property or bring have the sponsor bring more cash uh, to the cap table to lower the, the, the debt that's on that property, which lowers their LTV. So that's one scenario. The other scenario will be uh, the sponsor himself. So the sponsor usually goes into a property. Like I said, they put their 10, 15% equity in. And then number two or three years down the road, that equity has increased because the value of the property has gone up, not just because of interest rates, but because the property is actually doing what it's supposed to do. It's supposed to make money. Uh, they're supposed to increase the, the uh, value by you know upgrading the, the, bar, the apartment units, the, the bedrooms and all that. And increase the rent, and that increases the bottom line. So that equity in the property that goes up in value uh, is a problem when when cap rates start to go up and the value goes down. Their equity also drops. So uh, they had in the per previous example, they had fifteen percent equity, and the property uh, drops twenty five percent. That means that the sponsor has zero equity in that property, but they're still the GP. They're still managing the property, and they're hoping that things will turn around and get their equity back. So the big risk for them is that, wow, if cap rates go up, my equity was, is gone and I can't get my equity and my promote out of this asset. So that's a big problem for the sponsor. And then finally, you have the investor. These are the LP investors that come along underneath the sponsor and they put their money in. They're usually silent investors, so they don't make any decisions. They don't part, they're not part of the management team. They're just silent investors looking to get a good return on their money. Um, based on the cash, cash yield, as well as an IRR when they sell the asset. So when you see um, the cap rates go up and the value goes down, again, the equity from the LP investors who put in possibly 20 to 35% also goes down, right? And they could lose some or all of their equity, depending on how severely uh, the property value uh, goes down. So many people are at risk when property values go down, that's the bottom line. And they, they would like to change that scenario as much as possible. And there's only a few options they can actually look at today's world to change those scenarios. Interesting. You know, I appreciate the breakdown. That definitely helps, you know, paint the picture for a lot of us and really understanding, you know, how does the structure here or the cap table work and and how does everyone get affected by these interest rates? So rather than taking out a loan, right? So rather than having the bank involved who's do, making the loan or and rather than having a GP take out, you know, a loan, you know, on this real estate, how does tokenization afford issuers an alternative option? Good question. So, you know, the, what I just mentioned is the three character, three right. different um, products uh, on the cap table are in, are kind of in trouble, or in distress, and they're all waiting for the asset to either improve in performance to bring the value up. So. You know, the bottom line increases somehow, they charge more rent in the bottom line, or um, they just wait for cap rates to get better and come down. But in the meantime, they're stuck with a liquidity problem. Uh, the investors can't get out because the value has dropped. The sponsor can't get out because the value has dropped. And the bank uh, wants to get out, but has no buyers to get out. And if they did have to sell, they would sell for major loss. So where security tokens of tokenization come into play, is that now um, the sponsor could actually look towards reducing or eliminating the bank debt with capital coming through from investors. So for example, you have a $50 million property and a $25 million bank loan, uh, which is 50% LTV. Um, if that bank loan was gonna become problematic and in, in when it comes to renewal, they say, look, we don't think the property's worth $50 million anymore because of cap rates or properties worth $30 million, that's a $20 million haircut, right? Well, in order for the sponsor to get a new loan, they have to value the property at $20 million, which means they're going to have to probably put money out of their pocket to put into the property in order to get that bank loan. We would come in as Red Swan and evaluate the situation and say, look, that $20 million loan should be just paid off with you know sponsors, with, which is basically um, LP equity. Uh, which is preferred equity. 
uh, from LP investors. And so that comes in and replaces that $20 million debt from the bank. The bank is now removed from the equation. The new equity owners come in as a preferred position, which means that the first dollar is made, they get the first dollar before even the sponsors do or the other common shareholders do. Uh, but it takes away the problem of the sponsor getting foreclosed by the bank because now the bank is out of the equation and it allows them to get what we call friendly equity, which is a, a interest rate that may be at or below the current prevailing rate, just because these investors are looking at it, not necessarily from a banking standpoint, but from a longer term hold situation, right? They're coming in at a valuation of $20 million as opposed to $50 million. They're taking out the bank which was $20 million debt, and they're putting in their, their, their preferred equity in, and they're going to get a preferred return, let's say 6%, it's going to be a preferred return. They might be, banks might be getting 8% for the money on a loan, but they'll take 6% because that's good cash flow for them. And the property more likely over the next five or 10 years could go back from um, the $20 million where it's at right now, back to 50 or even $60 million in the next five or 10 years. So that's a great upside for the investor coming in with security tokens. I like that. I like that a lot. So you're restructuring, I guess, uh, how this property is financed. You're taking out the bank. New investors can come in and, and get a, a piece of the cake here. And now, and so for the issuer, that's great, right? You mentioned that they're getting rid of the risk of getting foreclosed on. There's more of a friendly environment. Um, let's switch it over to the issue or sorry to the investor standpoint of view. You know, you know, you mentioned there's a long-term play. They're really just want exposure to this. Um, do you feel that investors, because they realize, or at least those that are sophisticated enough to realize that they are essentially taking on in this example, the $20 million loan for themselves. Do you feel that it's still fair to them or do they feel you know justifiable? They're they're comfortable with this investment because it's that long term, uh, you know, game. Or how do you, what do you think the psychology is for the investor in this situation here? Uh, I think investors have to really think about it because a lot of people this is new structuring. This is all brand new um, deal structuring. But if you think about it from their standpoint, they have reduced their risk substantially mm -hmm. because the the um, the shadow of getting foreclosed is gone, so they won't lose the asset. Um, more likely the asset is still producing, still generating income. The only reason why the value is down is because interest rates have gone up and cap rates have gone up. So that's the only reason why that value has shrunk from 50 million in this case to 20 million or 30 million. So they're buying at a good value when they come in at $30 million basis instead of $50 million basis. Mm -hmm. um, they are getting the pri priority on payouts so that there's, every dollar that's made, they get theirs first. Um, and so I think they have a better upside for this asset in terms of you know, long-term value and they have liquidity. So for some reason they buy in at this $30 million level and the property does not improve in value for a couple of years, they can still sell their shares to someone else who's seeing the future of this asset also coming in at a low basis. Maybe it's now $30 million, maybe it's $35 million now. And they're seeing that this thing is going to ride up back to 50 or 60. So they still have a way to sell those shares and get liquidity. But in the previous scenario, when there is no uh, security tokens involved, more than likely the bank is going to foreclose on the asset and all the equity is wiped out. So, you know, I think there's a better, you know, better chances, less risk when you're buying into an asset when you take out the bank and you're now a preferred equity uh, investor uh, and you're looking at this asset at a better cost basis. I like that a lot. I think that that makes total sense, especially for investors that, um, in the previous world, aside from not being able to get in on this on the original deal, right? They, and they have to deal with the foreclosure of risk and all, and whatnot, the interest rates. Aside from that, now these investors also just have general access to these properties, which a lot of people don't have access to in a traditional sense, right? They, they're able to come in at lower investment minimums which allows them, I believe, to be able to distribute and invest in multiple properties rather than going all in on one or two. So can, can we talk a little bit more about, you know, what the maybe tokenomics look like or why people are, you know, what else is tokenization, I guess, uh, enable for these investors? So we've talked about liquidity. We've talked about getting some of this, rid of some of this risk. Let's talk about access and maybe portfolio management. Yeah, no, good, good point. Um, I like to think that, you know, a few dollar cost average on investments, you can 
not have to think about it, but be gaining in your portfolio value overall, right? That's usually what, you know, wealth advisors tell you is to, if you like something, don't just put all your eggs in one basket at the same time, because you might be buying in too low, or you might be buying in way too high. So you start by dollar cost averaging. And in this case, you can dollar cost average on a portfolio, on a select portfolio of assets that you choose. And so therefore, by having more than one, let's say five assets you're investing $20,000 into on an annual basis, you're spreading your risk on five assets instead of one. And also you're able to dollar cost average and keep increasing your investment in those assets. That's a huge deal for when you think about wealth management and investment advice. And I'm not, of course, offering any advice right now, but when you think about that, you want to reduce risk and you want to diversify yourself uh, and you want to eliminate you know, problems like foreclosure. So I think uh, besides the liquidity aspect is just allowing people to buy into properties at a price point they can afford and around the world. They're not just you know, limited to United States or to New York or California. You can pick assets anywhere in the world that have been tokenized and run by good operators and buy fractional shares of those assets as well. I love that. And so let's let's talk about some of that, you know, access around the world. Let's say there's, you know, interest rates rising in, in America and maybe people are not as comfortable, but they still want to allocate some money towards tokenized assets in the US. That's fantastic. What about properties overseas? Can we talk about like maybe some other projects that you guys are working on? I know you guys have some stuff going on in Africa. Why would someone else want to, in this environment, also participate in overseas properties? Opportunity, right? I mean, if you're looking at uh, apartment buildings in the United States, of course, we're always going to be attracted to where there's higher demand for renters. And that's a beautiful place to buy apartments because you'll be able to increase rents on a regular basis, right? And the nice thing about apartments is you can, they're only short term one year leases. So every year you could potentially increase your income, which is why people like the apartment industry. But what if you're looking over in Vietnam and you're seeing uh, apartment buildings in the CBD of Vietnam, which are you know tenants that are highly qualified, have great jobs, and the rate of return is you know 25% more than what you're seeing in the United States. Um, you know, of course, you're gonna want to do your homework to make sure you understand who the you know, operator of that property is, where it's located, how it's built. But let's just say it ticks all those boxes with a great operator, institutional operator. Uh, and also great location and stable rents. You might want to expand your uh, investment portfolio to include that asset as well because it's paying 25% higher dividend and has similar uh, type of risk. Um, on the other hand, if, you look, if you're living in Vietnam or living in Brazil and you're suffering from high inflation in Brazil, we know that's a big problem for that country. You put your money in the bank it's losing money every single day, right? And you just can't keep up with inflation. But if you saw an asset in the United States that is an uh, apartment building that's stable in, in, in Chicago, for example, and you bought shares of that property, now you're able to get dividends in United States dollars that are coming to you uh, on chain that will offset the depreciation from the inflation you're seeing in your local market. So in a way, you don't have to have your money at risk with your local currency. You can put it into real estate that's actually generating you a return and holding its value uh, and hedging against inflation, which real estate does, and has the, li the liquidity option. So if you wanted to sell it, you can get out and get your capital back, which your capital coming back from a U.S. asset that's performing will be higher than the capital in the bank in Brazil, for example, much higher. So these are reasons why people need to look around the globe for opportunities and not just look in your backyard. Love that. I love that. So, right. You want to diversify, get different options going and everyone's, you know, situation is different. Everyone's financial situation and what their goals are. So as you mentioned, none of this is financial advice, but definitely some of the conversation I think is worth having with any financial advisor um, and same for the RIAs and whatnot. They should be definitely taking a look into these assets for their clients. I think it's, you know, as a fiduciary, I think it's it's worth noting that these are opportunities that they could very well be taken advantage of. It's a good point. I'm gonna I'm gonna suggest something else before you go next topic because that's really important. You know, we spend a lot of time um, with the independent broker dealers of America. So we go to their their conferences, their due diligence conferences, and this is where all the IRAs and broker dealers go 
to receive content that they can refer to their customers. They always want to go someplace that has been verified uh, because that checks the box that they're not just taking something off the street and then trying to sell it to their customer. They always want to go someplace where a lawyer has written a legal opinion on the project or have investigated the project so they know it's sound, they know the sponsor is sound, and now they're offering something that they can verify to their client. Well, I've been to these conferences over the past couple of years, and 95% of people I talk to who are broker dealers and RAs have never heard of digital securities. So wow. they're they're in a situation where they're doing things the old-fashioned way, of course. They're pushing um, stocks you know, that are not digital. But imagine if they start to uh, have assignments from their sponsors who are raising $50 million or $100 million and... 25% of that $100 million is available in a digital stock instead of a non-digital stock. And he tells the customer that same customer, same sponsor, same property, same return. This is this one you carry in your own digital wallet. Uh, and whenever you want to sell it, you have the liquidity option to go and take it to market and sell. Whereas the other one, you have no option to sell. I think, especially the, the millennials and the, the new generation of, of uh, investors coming out, are going to like the option of liquidity. They're going to like the option of flexibility. And they're probably going to choose that as opposed to the traditional one. So this is like opening up a new uh, opportunity for the IRAs and the broker dealers is to offer digital as well as offering uh, non-digital. So I, I like that. And, it, and also I'm going to say one more thing is that we've gone, I travel a lot. So I've gone to throughout Africa and people are very surprised in the United States that that the countries like Africa, Nigeria, have high-rise skyscrapers, CBD properties with Microsoft and, and uh, Arthur Young or all these major uh, conglomerates housed in these buildings paying rent. People don't realize that, but they are there. So if you have a building in the United States where you're housing Disney or Microsoft and you're feeling comfortable with triple net lease there, and you look and you see in Abidjan, which is... Um, uh, capital of uh, Ivory Coast, they're offering a building the same size and has Microsoft as a tenant there as well. And the rate of return is higher. You're going to have to think about that. At least it's something for you to consider, whereas before you would never consider uh, anything outside the border. So for that reason, I think digital securities are you know just way above uh, the value of other types of securities. Uh, so many great points there, Ed. I mean, with the RIAs and BDs, I mean, you're, you're absolutely right. A lot of them don't know about this. I just a month ago did a webinar on, you know, wealth management and security tokens, right? Why, do, why does this matter? Why do they need to start paying attention? And we've talked about granularity and really being able to restructure portfolios. Now we've talked about access to new assets for some of these clients um, and for individuals in general, right? Now, I think there's a generational transfer of wealth going on. And with that comes a new investment appetite for risk for different opportunities. Obviously, all the young people are looking into crypto now and anything related to blockchain. So this is at least an asset that's, at, or sorry, a token that's actually backed by a real world asset. Um, so it's a nice blend, in my opinion, of Web3 and traditional finance and opportunity to, to other uh, investments. Um, you did touch on a point that I really quickly wanted to clarify on earlier, which was that you're if you're in a third world country that's you know suffering from inflation and whatnot, you are investing in a U.S. dollar denominated asset and you're getting e uh, dividends back in U.S. dollars. Do you through Red Swan get those through USDC or a check, a wire? How does that work? Good point. Um, we use USDC or USDT, which are stable coins based on U.S. dollar. Okay. Those we can easily take in and not have to have a, a currency FX risk. So uh, theoretically, many layer ones now are offering uh, stable coins, right? And they're registering like your Coinbase now is doing a stable coin with Circle. So every platform will have its fair share of stable coins that its constituents can buy or trade from their cryptocurrency, whether it be Bitcoin, Ethereum, whatever, into the stable coin. And now with that stable coin, they can buy anything they want to buy at a dollar, dollar value. And that's what they can come to us with. So they are sitting on top of a you know, couple billion dollars worth of, of cryptocurrency and it's fluctuating every single day and they're not sure what, where it's going to go and they want to hedge against that risk. They can take some of their you know, two, $2 million in this case and invest it into digital real estate. So they're now getting a return uh, and now getting more stability. They may not get 
the super 40% rise in value uh, that happens sometimes when you're spiking in cryptocurrency, but you will get consistent returns and you will have less chance on uh, losses taking place because you're buying a solid asset that um, you just can't produce every day. Very cool. And actually, I love that you guys are using USDC, USDT. I mean, uh, I think another point to bring up real quick on the cross-border situation is remittance payments. A lot of people in the past have sent money from the U.S. to family back in Mexico or elsewhere. I know I have. And when that happens, you're usually taxed a, a fat fee. Uh, it's not pretty. Which In the U.S., maybe it's digestible based on the amount that you're sending. But to the people that are receiving it, they're receiving a, well, a smaller amount than you intended to send. And that difference really could be the difference between do I buy a loaf of bread? Do I buy you know this piece of food? So with USDC, USDT, you're eliminating that fee, which I think is another great feature, by the way. So aside, mm -hmm. aside from getting that U.S. dollar denominated asset, you're also removing some of that uh, transaction fee and whatnot. So that's Just very true. And we, we like to think the same thing, that when you're buying, at least when you're buying from Red Swan digital securities, your dollar, I'd say 99.9% .9 of your dollar is going to the equity that you're buying. As opposed to you're buying at a mutual fund or some kind of a uh, ETF, you're paying a, a low fee to get in and you're paying a low fee to get out. So when you factor that into your overall investment, you're actually getting much less of return for the risk you're taking for those mutual funds because you had to pay so many people along the way. Mm -hmm. uh, this way, if we're selling uh, $50,000 worth of uh, security tokens of a building, you're buying that $50,000. You're not even seeing any kind of payment at all that's being taken out, like a brokerage fee, none of that. Matter of fact, the sponsor pays for the fees, our fees for, for putting on the platform. So the buyer is getting a direct investment into the asset. And I think that's really important um, when you start looking at you know, be more efficient with your investment dollars. No, I like that a lot. So we've talked about the issuer side and why, you know, tokenization is really helping with as an alternative to, uh, you know, or financing method for these properties. We talked on the investor side, why they want to participate in into these tokenized properties. Let's go back a little bit back to the issuer. Um, are they only able to issue equity tokens or debt tokens possible? And what's the difference between the two? And why would someone choose to tokenize debt? Yeah, so debt is an instrument. Um, and the difference is debt is collateralized to the assets. So you have loan documents that you have put together. Uh, there's also a definite payout um, when the when the loan matures, the capital will come back. So all this has to be, you know, uh, put into the, the uh, smart contract for the token if it's going to be debt. Uh, and it has to be recorded as well so that it's there as a lien against the asset. Whereas equity doesn't need to have a lien and equity doesn't need to have a finite date uh, of redemption. Uh, the redemption is whenever you want to sell your shares, go to an exchange, list your shares on the exchange and put an ask price on it. And that's how you get your redemption. So you can do both. We choose to focus on the equity side right now because you know, the debt side is already out there and it's really a lot easier to get debt at least up until the past, you know, six, seven months. It's really easy to get debt, but we are looking at um, debt tokens as well. We have the capability of doing that. It's just more work involved in creating a debt token than an equity token. Totally get it. And at least for now, I mean, we don't want to focus at least on adoption and getting this as quickly as possible out there for people to be able to, to use as a sponsor and as an investor. Um, so that's fantastic. We want to make it easy. You know, I think the whole idea is simplifying real estate investments. And that's our, our slogan is because it shouldn't be so hard, right? It, you know, we list a lot of properties on our site, which are single tokenized assets that offer a decent return. But when we polled a lot of our users, they're telling us, I need advice to know which one I want to invest in. I mean, this one's making 10%. This one's making 15%. This one's making, you know, 6%. Which ones should we invest in? And you know, our advisors can give them advice, but we don't want it to be a challenge. We think that you know a person should be able to make a quick investment decision based on solid facts. And I think coming out with funds um, is a great way to be able to sell a, a tokenized asset because right away you're pooling the assets together, giving them a, a diversified portfolio. Uh, and also a average uh, yield indices so that uh, they can understand that overall they're going to get a certain value. And it takes the pressure off of having to figure out which one of these 10 assets are the best one for me to put my money in. It's better to say, 
let me blend on all these multifamily assets across the country and get an average return of X and have a pretty good comfort level that that's going to happen as opposed to just betting everything on, on one uh, asset. So we like to look at funds and that we think that's an easier way for people to bite off uh, investments. That's fantastic. Yeah. I mean, I, for one, I'm not going to pretend I know how to select one piece of real estate over another. If I have a fund, I think that makes a lot more sense to be able to, again, diversify my risk and get some of that reward and participate in real estate, which I don't think I would have been able to in the past. Um, and also, you know, as in a Web3 investor, right? If you're in Web3, you're going into all these stable coins or sorry, altcoins, you know, like Dogecoin and everything that's, you know, pretty with all the super high, um, you know, rates of return that we've seen in the past, but you may want to hedge some of that, right? And so real estate seems like a safer bet, or at least to allocate some of your, uh, you know, money into that as well. So it's a good mix for portfolios. Um, the other thing I wanted to bring up, Ed, was, you know, on the same notion of, you know, uh, breaking down investment minimums and check sizes, you know, in the past for some of these high quality assets, I would assume that the investment minimum was very high and anyone with a smaller check size that wanted to invest, but just didn't make that minimum, I would assume that they were left with riskier assets, maybe less quality assets. Would you say that that's true or, you know, how does tradition that happen traditionally? It is true. It is true. And the reason for that is because, again, if you're focused on U.S. investors, um, there's a requirement under the SEC to prevent yourself from being a publicly traded uh, entity that mm -hmm. you have to have less than 2,000 investors, right? And so if you're raising $100 million and you're only charging a, you know, $500 to $1,000, you're going to break over that, that, that threshold pretty quickly. Many of the major institutions like um, Tishman Spire or CIM or all these big companies, they usually go with the 506B, but they only go off to less than 100 investors who write large checks, $20, $30 million checks. And that's what they're comfortable with. But if you wanted to raise more money and you wanted to make it more uh, equitable for smaller investors, then you have to do two things. Either you can go to 2000 with the um, US accredited investors, or you can also include foreign investors who don't have that cap. So, so there's just, I think for the larger deals, we're trying to, of course, fill up the, the first 2000 with accredited investors. And for therefore, we have to raise the price point to maybe 25,000, sometimes $50,000 in order to get enough coverage to, to meet that demand. But we also, uh, on the second, on the other side, can lower the price point for uh, Reg S investors so they can actually buy at a much more affordable cost and get into a quality asset. We think that's very important um, for everyone to be involved and in be able to have a good quality portfolio of assets. Otherwise, you are stuck with buying the more difficult the older class C type prop projects, because those are the ones that are priced lower and those ones you can afford to fractionalize uh, your, your crowdfunding investment into, but they also have the highest amount of risk, right? Uh, an asset, yeah. apartment asset that's 25, 30 years old um, and is not in the best location, has more risk on things breaking down, people not paying rent. And so I don't think it's good for the average investor to be, you know, regulated to that type of asset. I think they should have the same exposure that, you know, Bill Gates and Warren Buffett have and, and be able to join them on that type of investment. Perfectly well said. I like that. I and mean, thanks for clarifying that as well. Awesome, Ed. Um, well, okay, cool. So, you know, we talked about the funds on Red Swan, which I love. I think that's great for a lot of investors. For the issuers, I mean, for anyone listening, and if you have properties, I mean, it sounds like, uh, Red Swan's a great, you know, way to at least consider, you know, how tokenization can help, you know, refinance or, uh, you know, provide capital for some of your properties. How do people get in touch with Red Swan? What's the process of, you know, tokenizing an asset with Red Swan? Well, they reach out on our website. There's a there's an application that says um, to if you're interested in, in tokenizing your property, you want to share that with us. That's the first step. Or you can text me on DM me on LinkedIn or or Simon uh, as well, or anyone in our sales department, you can email, you can DM and they'll get back to you. But it takes a little process for us to understand the asset, to be able to do an analysis on it and the feasibility of the asset to make sure it makes sense for us. And then once we pass that threshold, now we go under engagement in order to take the asset and convert it to a digital uh, form. But 
I, you know, I think people should just start waking up because, you know, the world has changed. You know, everyone keeps thinking that, ah, it's going to be down the road. Ah, it's down the road. Just like when websites say coming out, ah, I don't need one right now. That's down the road. But, you know, in order to be a leader in the market or in order to really, you know, capture the best the market has to offer, you should take an early stance, an early position on something that you know is changing. Don't duck and hide and wait for it to become common because now you're at the back of the line trying to catch up. And I think with tokenization, people are thinking that it's down the road. It's not happening yet. It's still, no, these major corporations, these major institutions are all in on tokenization to the point where they're setting thresholds of how much assets under management they want to be digitized versus non-digitized because they're looking at the efficiency effect of those assets. So if you're an individual trying to figure out what to do, read up as much as you possibly can on the tokenization, digital assets, understand what you want to do and get involved. I mean, just start making sure you have an allocation of it. So you're, you're current with this technology. Otherwise you're going to, and when you're current with the technology, then you can actually provide, you know, conversations with people that you're near and dear to about what you understand. I put it simply, I was talking to a, a, an executive uh, from a big company, Goldman Sachs, wealth management. And he says, you know, I'm in, Press with what you guys are doing. It makes so much sense and is so relevant. But for some reason, our company has not even told us what's coming down the pipeline. So we're, I'm learning by talking to you and by doing my own research because I'm scared that I might not have a job or I might not be relevant in the next 24 months if this thing takes off. And so I think like he's being smart about it, right? He's actually reaching out. He's coming to events. He's talking about it so he can get educated because He's in a position where he has to advise people. And if he can get good information and start advising people early, he's going to have more clients and take clients from those who can't give that advice. So he's thinking ahead. And I'm saying that to everybody out there is to start thinking ahead so you can now you know, get the benefit of this change in technology, these cracks in our system. You can now start filling those cracks with your super glue or whatever it is to in, insert yourself because you don't it's gonna be sealed up and you're gonna be on the outside trying to find your way to get in. And people who, who came early with a lot less capital are probably much further ahead than you are just because they were you know, early adopters. Makes total sense to me. Yeah, I mean, whether you're an asset manager for your clients, whether you're an investor for yourself, um, even for the GPs, right? How do you make your relationship with your LPs a little bit smoother, a little bit better, get rid of some of those headaches in case you need to liquidate someone? Yeah. I think this makes total sense for every single party in the process. So, you know, follow Red Swan, follow Ed, get educated on this stuff, stm.co as well. We have a lot of content surrounding tokenization um, and how you can get involved and how it impacts you from different angles. Absolutely. Awesome. You couldn't have said it better. <laughs> Awesome. Well, appreciate your time, Ed. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, you know, we'll be able to circulate this to all of our audience. For anyone watching, make sure you send this video over to anyone that you think it'll be of impact, of inspiration to, because to Ed's point, this is a uh, something that's not going away by any means. So, you know, share away. Thanks for having me, Jason. Really appreciate it. Absolutely. Likewise. Thank you. Take care.